Peace, love, and light, family. It's your girl. Okay, sorry, my iPad was frozen. I'm not sure what y'all heard. But peace, love, and light. It's your girl, Morgan Renee Myers. Tuning in with you all on this terrific Tuesday, April 2nd, 2019. I've had like a really emotional day. I don't know what's been up with me today. I think it's just the energy in the air. I am like on a little detox cleanse. I've just been drinking water. Haven't really been consuming any food outside of like the orange. Last night, 10 o'clock at night, I warm, heated me up some green beans on the stove with, like, some different spices and stuff. But other than that, I haven't been eating. So, I don't know if it's just, like, me being lethargic or what. But i just been emotional as hell today. So, did some crying, did some reading. or well, tried to do some reading. Took a nap. Um, crocheted some things. So, these little uh, chokers, I am selling them for uh, $15, and they are 20 if you want calorie shells added to them. If you want copper and crystal dangling from them, that will be 30 Um, And I will be posting. I also made this little top long, long, long ago. Actually, it, it was supposed to be a skirt, Um, so it could be either or. Hold on, let me get the rest of the chokers so I can show y'all. Um, but they're going to be so cute. And there will be some other ones that will be $10. I'll post them later. And for, like, the babies, those will be 10 like the little kids. But, yeah, they're so cute. Got different colors. I'm going to have some black. This is with a, a necklace that had broke. These little charmed ones was from a necklace that had broke. And I thought they were so cute and should be used for something. So I put them on here. And some people are into that kind of stuff. But anyways, um, reading is a is a soothing mechanism for me. So I thought, let me just hop on live and read. And I upload these to my YouTube. And people appreciate it. So either you do or you don't. So I'm just going to finish chapter 6. So no disrespect if you haven't checked it out by Sister Soldier. She's the one that wrote The Coldest Winter Ever and Midnight. It's a very, very good book. It's an autobiography of her life. And so far in the chapter with Chance, um, it's showing signs that he might be controlling her crazy because he, like, was coming at her confidently, which I think a lot of women like in a man. And he was, like, pretty much telling her, you know, you my woman, this and this and that. And, like, um, actually kind of messing up business a little bit. Like, some guy came into business to, like, give her money for an organization she was raising money for. And he pretty much told him, like, to get on, not to do business with her or whatever. So... I'm getting the impression, context clues, that he probably going to be in bad shit crazy, but we shall see. Peace, brother. How do you say your name? Cleatus? Cleatus? Donaldson? Thank you. I appreciate you. So I'm just going to finish the chapter. And y'all just send me love and light. Okay. So the work toward the summer camp was progressing. I had completed the curriculum. I had designed the budget. Bill Stephanie confirmed the appearance of Public Enemy, LL Cool J, Heavy D, Big Daddy Kane, Stesta Sonic, NC Light, and other rappers. With this lineup, I went to Reverend Chavis and convinced him to lend our project $20,000 to be returned on the night of the concert after ticket sales, which I believe were certain to sell out. I used the money to rent the Apollo Theater, Run radio advertisements, make posters, print flyers, arrange transportation, provide food, and underwrite production costs for the artist's equipment. I was pumped up and Chan shared my enthusiasm. He asked if he could perform the opening act in the show to help advance his music career. This is a big chance, he explained, because everybody in the industry would be there. He was sure that once they heard him and saw his show, they would love him. It seemed so important to him that I agreed. Plus, I figured it couldn't possibly hurt. The concert was a major success. We earned over $60,000. It all went straight to the church. In a single evening, I repaid my debt, insured the camp, and created a pool of money from which we could sponsor at least five more different types of events to fulfill the camp budget. Everybody was buzzing since it had not been at all certain that we would be able to operate the camp. The rappers felt good that they got an opportunity to meet the children the money was for. I felt good because I had begun, if only in a modest way, to provide for the children's future. As for Chance, the show was a disaster. His group was laughed at and booed off the stage Apollo style. Chance had decided to include Blinky, even though Blinky had no talent. He did it because he felt the concert would be their big break. If they were discovered and went on to be famous, he wanted his loyal cousin and companion to be part of it all. Even though they had repeatedly rehearsed, Blinky froze on stage and was so awful, he managed to convince the audience that their act was a comedy skit. 
The whole thing depressed Chance. He was not used to losing. Wednesday night, Chance didn't show up for one of our dates. I waited nervously in my apartment, flipping from one television channel to another, pacing the floor. I was worried. The phone rang about 10 p.m., and it was Chance's singer friend, Gary. He said Chance had been picked up and arrested. The charge was murder. I was speechless. Are you there? Gary asked. Murder? I muttered. Who? Who did they say he murdered? Chance doesn't even know who. Chance don't know nothing about the whole thing. He just wanted me to call you so you wouldn't worry. Wouldn't worry? You called me about a murder charge so I wouldn't worry? Where is he? Where is Chance? I want to see him. He's at the precinct around our way, but you never know. They might have him sent to Central Booking or he might have appeared before the judge already. When did this happen? Gary's phone beeped for call waiting. He asked me to hold on. When he came back, he said, that was Chance. He said, make sure you don't call his mother because she's sick and he doesn't want to worry her because it might make her condition worse. He needs $10,000 bail, so I guess he'll be in there for a while. His tone was matter of fact. Immediately after Gary's call, I started calling Jasmine, Kim, Tracy, every friend I ever had asking them for money. By early morning, I had gathered $4,000 in commitments to be collected later that day. I was frustrated because I knew that I would not be able to get the kind of money that Chance needed. Still, I thought if I came up with a portion, maybe Chance's family and friends could come up with the rest. I started looking around my apartment at the various items I could sell. I was willing to fight for Chance because I knew damn well he didn't murder anybody because he was so sweet. Because he was too sweet. Jasmine came and picked me up, driving me around after the bank opened to deposit the money I had collected. I decided I would find Chance, talk to him, tell him how much money I had, and ask his advice. Jasmine had a million questions, but I asked her not to talk for the sake of my twisted nerves. Try as we might, we could not find Chance. I checked the precinct. Precinct, Central Booking, Precinct's next to the precinct I originally thought he was in, nor could I contact Blinky or Gary. Frustrated and crying, I returned to my apartment and collapsed in the chair while Jasmine fell asleep on the floor. Hours passed. I was frantic and feeling helpless. Then, at 6 p.m., Chance's calm, smooth, sexy, and confident voice was on the other end of my telephone, bringing joy and relief to my heart. I was so excited, I started asking a zillion questions. He couldn't get a word in edgewise. Slow down, sweetness, he said. Listen, it was all a big mistake. See, there's some cops around my way who have it out for me because they don't like the way I walk and talk and the respect I carry with me. So whenever something goes down around this way, they automatically come and pick me up just to harass me. You know how it is. So the other night, they started asking me about some kid that got murdered. I told them I didn't know nothing, but they weren't trying to hear it, so they ran me in. But they had nothing on me, so eventually they had to let me go. So you know they were pissed off. A big smile creased my face. I was relieved that Chance was home. I was more relieved that what I thought all along was true. Chance would never hurt anybody. He wasn't that kind of guy. He said he was coming right over and I longed to hold him in my arms once again. That night I cried. I told Chance how happy I was to have him back and how much I loved him. Like a proud little girl, I tried to impress him with the fact that I didn't lose my cool throughout the entire scare. I added that I had managed to collect $4,000 from all my friends. I confessed that half of it was my entire savings since I had started working. He sat in the bed with a smile that brightened the room and said, Baby, you did all of that for me? I am an activist, I said proudly. I don't sit by and watch. I make things happen. Did you think I would let somebody just come and take my man away? What did you do with the money? I hope you're not going to keep it here in the apartment. What do you think? I'm stupid. I gave it to Jasmine. She left before you got here. She'll take it back to all my friends that lent it to me. I'm just glad you're home. The following weekend, I had to go to Los Angeles to speak at UCLA at, an invitation, at the invitation of the Campus African Student Group. I didn't want to go, but something inside of me, probably my mother's voice from early childhood, reminded me that I should not place a man before my educational commitment. So off I went. When I returned, I was met by an empty apartment. My belongings were all gone. Television gone, VCR gone, stereo gone, jewelry gone, my personal items tossed about. I stood in the middle of the floor, horrified, not at the notion that my material possessions had been taken from me, but at the fact that my little home had been invaded. In a panic, I called Chance. He told me he would be right there. He ordered me to go out and sit on the stoop and wait for him where everybody could see me so he'd be sure that nothing would happen to me. When he arrived, I think Chance raided her apartment. When he arrived, he assured me that he would take care of everything. He advised me not to panic or mess with the police. There were ways things could be resolved on the street. Then he... 
Then he proceeded to lecture me about my damned independence. He told me that all women need protection. Yet I, he went on, thought I could walk all around and move all around the country and be all right. He said the reason why my apartment was robbed was because the men in the neighborhood didn't see no man living here taking care of you, protecting you. I was considered open and vulnerable. Then he asked me if I could follow directions. I smiled and said, if I think they're good directions. He told me to go sleep over at my girlfriend Tracy's house. He would take me there. Then he said I should meet him for lunch tomorrow at Roy Rogers next to his job in Midtown. I agreed. The next day, Chance was smiling as usual. He handed me an envelope with $300 in it and told me to go buy another television. Meanwhile, he would take care of everything else. I didn't want to take his money because I knew he was saving it for his investments. I told him the television and the VCR were mostly for the kids and we would all be leaving in a month and a half to go to the camp anyway. He told me that, once again, I wasn't following directions, so I took it. Then he said, the next thing is we are going to get married. Just as I was, I was just about blasted through the roof with excitement. I couldn't believe it. I never imagined what happened to me this way. After I finished bugging out, smiling, gasping, I said, When? Where? What about your mother? I haven't even met her yet. That's your job, he said. You pick the date. You pick the place, the date, and the whole nine yards. You tell me when, and I'll be there. As for my mother, let me break the news to her. Then you and her can talk. But when? This year? Next year? When? I said, my head swirling. I don't want to wait. You need somebody to take care of you. You need protection, so let's just do it. Go ahead, send out the invitations. I'll bring the ring on Friday and some money, too. As for my mother, she loves me. And once I tell her that I love you, she'll love you because I love you. He smiled and added, there's one catch. You have to learn to follow the rules if you're going to be my wife. And what rules are those? I asked with laughter in my heart. You do what I say. I'm your husband. You take the lead from me. I don't like you running around. I don't like you running all around the streets being involved in all the stuff you're involved in. I don't like you traveling because it's too dangerous. Plus, you're surrounded by too many men all the time. If you need to meet with men, you need me to go with you or me to go instead of you. We'll get a bigger apartment until we save for a house and you move your office in there so I can watch you. Ooh. I don't know. I, I, I think I agree with the notion that men lead, but like a woman like me, I think I might be, what did they say earlier, too damn independent. Like, I know I, I get a lot of stuff done on my own. I'm inherent. I be always single. So I know that with a man, I would want to fall back a little, let him lead. But you're not going to stop me from doing what I already was doing as far as like traveling and making money. Like, this is what I do, honey. I get paid to speak, to do poetry, to sell oils, to crochet, to network, like, just be in a house so you can watch me all the time? I don't know about that. And I'll move your office in here so I can watch you. I began to laugh so hard I nearly fell out the restaurant booth. I laughed so hard my sides started to ache. I laughed so hard tears came to my eyes. I glanced at Chance's face. It was stern and angry. He wanted to know what I was laughing at and reminded me that he didn't like to be mocked. This, he said, was serious. How could you know me so well, who I am, what I stand for, what I believe in, the work I do, how much I love African people, then turn around and attempt to turn me into some little speechless housewife who takes orders from you because you're a man? That's funny, I exclaimed, still laughing. How could you take the female with the biggest mouth and the most to say and try to lock her up in a house? See, it's so funny. I mean, I love you, but you must be some kind of comedian or something. I was still was convulsed in laughter. Look. Do you want to be my wife or not? Of course I do, but I mean, I don't want to lose myself. What do you mean no traveling? I've already been to England and France. I studied in Spain. I've been to Portugal, Finland, the Soviet Union, Zimbabwe, Zambia, South Africa. Now you're asking me to go in reverse? That's impossible. Oh, I see. This is not going to work. His tone was indignant. Oh, is this the winner speaking? I mocked him. You just don't understand, he said, lowering and shaking his head. Understand what? How it has to be, he said. Listen, I'll meet you tonight after your class. We'll talk then. After class, I waited for a chance. He did not show up. This time, I did not panic because I knew I had thoroughly annoyed him at lunch. After all, he felt he was conferring the greatest honor, marriage, on me. So I headed home. I hoped that I wasn't sending him the wrong signals. I wanted to marry him. I loved him. I was completely flattered by his offer. I didn't want to seem ungrateful. My own girlfriends had long teased me for being old-fashioned, for doing things like cooking meals from scratch, remaining sexually loyal, and considering having umpteen babies because I love children. Chance was the first person ever that thought I was too liberal, stubborn, and independent. Days passed with no chance. I grew angry because I felt he was being 
petulant, acting like a child. I buried my emotions by plunging into work. I wasn't going to call him. After all, he was the one who had stood me up. As the camp departure date grew closer and closer, I had to run out, purchase books in bulk, comparison shop for sports equipment and other items. Not to my surprise, there were also some parents who had not taken their children for their required physicals. So, in addition to giving their children six weeks in a free sleepaway camp, I also had to escort some of them to doctors to get medical histories and clearance. Friday was supposed to be a ring day. I got no ring. I saw no chance. I broke down and called his house. His mother answered and said he wasn't home. She added, you know how you young folk are. You stay out and don't call. I don't know where he is, but when he gets in, I'll tell him to call. At about midnight, I was home in my bed. The doorbell rang. I got up, figuring Tassani needed a place to stay and had lost our key again. I looked through the peephole. It was Chance. I opened the door, and his big physique came strutting through in the dark shadows of my small living room. Hey, baby, I said, where you been? He didn't respond. I leaned over and turned on my small nightlight so I could see better. There he stood in jeans, sneakers, and a polo short shirt i was surprised because i was used to seeing him in his work clothes he was looking rugged and that turned me on just when the light caught a shimmering glimpse of his gold just then the light caught a shimmering glimpse of his gold chain and his moist mouth were what seemed like five gold teeth one with a diamond playing right in the middle then finally he spoke sit down so i sat he walked over to the window, pulled back the curtain, and looked out onto the street. I gotta hurry up. My boys are parked downstairs, and we got crazy work to put in tonight. Listen, me and you, it ain't gonna work out because we come from two different worlds. I don't know what I was thinking about messing with you in the first place. I sighed and thought to myself, not this bullshit again. He continued, you might as well know, I'm a drug dealer, a stone-cold street soldier. You, you're some kind of princess or savior or something, I don't know. He took out his beeper and his stack of neatly packed 10s, 20s, and 50s and said, these are my investments. I just thought you should know. I didn't want you worrying your pretty little head off. I know how much work you have to do. I stood up with tears in my eyes and got angry. So you think after all that we've been through, you can just walk through my door just like that and dismiss me as though I was one of your workers? Well, I ain't going for it. You think that I'm so thin-skinned that I'm going to stay later for you then? Well, that ain't it. Where's my damn ring? You supposed to be my husband, the winner. Chance smiled and said, you still want to marry me? Oh, baby, I didn't think you was that tough. And I interrupted. Don't give me that college girl shit either. We can get married, but you just have to change. That's what's life about anyway. Of course you have to stop selling drugs. It's against everything that I believe in. Everything. But it's not pop, but it's not impossible. You're talented and handsome. God know you're a good talker. You can do something else. Some other legal, profitable business. We can work on it together. If you could stop trying to stuff me in a closet and make me some powerless, silly little girl, I can help you. Chance was quiet. His face looked solemn and skeptical. He looked into my eyes and said, My spots are in white neighborhoods. It's not like I'm selling drugs to the blacks. Then you better quit selling... Anyway, because Whitey ain't going to let no nigga sell drugs to his kids in his place and stay alive. Only we allow our people to do that. Listen, Chance, it may be money, even big money, but it's short term. We can build for the long haul. You said you love me. Love is supposed to give you strength to overcome all weaknesses. I paused. So what's it going to be? Are you going to give the drugs up or are you going to give me up? I stood there resolved with my hands on my hips. Chance thought for what seemed like minutes on end. Then he flashed his smile and said... All right, baby, I'll do it, but I can't do it overnight. I have partners. I don't want to burn down no bridges and make no extra enemies. These are my boys who came down with me since the beginning through thick and thin. Can you give me a week? I nodded with approval. Meet me on meet me on Friday at Sobraro's. I'll bring the ring, and we be in there. He smiled and got up and walked out into the night. Now, Sister Soldier, no, she's straight tripping. Okay, let's see how this goes. Alone, I sat on my couch, thinking. I had appeared strong and in control in front of Chance, but I was inwardly confused and mad at myself for not having seen what was going on. Somehow, I just couldn't get this man thing right. I thought Chance was different. I was weak for him. I was so seduced by his sexiness that I think I was more attracted to the attraction than the actual sex. I loved the masculine way he presented himself, the way he walked in, the way that he talked and smelled. I knew that when I was with him, I was protected. I was sure that any person or group that confronted him in a beef would be whipped. I loved how warm his hands felt all the time, the way he reminded me all day that I was beautiful. I loved how he treated me as an individual woman, not as a political entity or a black leader. He had a knack for pushing the right buttons. The next morning when Chance called, the sounded, excuse me, the next morning when Chance called, he sounded smooth and excited. He said his boys wanted to meet me. They had told him I must be a bad bitch if I had convinced him <laughs> to close up shop. 
He said he'd bring them by one night. He told me not to worry. Don't bring your drug dealer friends to my house. He told me not to worry. He loved me and he would see me on Friday. I arrived at Sabrero's, Sabrero's Friday excited enough to burst. I had gone to get a manicure earlier to prepare for my ring. I stepped into the restaurant early and was surprised to see Chance sitting in the back waiting. I looked at his eyes expecting him to return my loving gaze but all I saw was uneasiness and worry. I rushed to the booth and said, hey baby, what's wrong? Will is dead. Who? Will. My man, my ace. I had never heard that name before. Chance looked dead serious. Then he continued. We was chilling in the diner the other night talking about who was going to take over my end of the business. Me, Will, and the boys. There were some other niggas in the booth across from us. So the nigga on the other side kept beaming on Will. You know, like he wanted beats or something. So Will jumped up and said, what motherfucker, you want some of this? So the kid nodded to his boys, laughed, and they left. I told Will right then and there he he shouldn't have done the kid. Because I don't like to do too much talking. Plus, if we see the kid again and he catch a fall catch us off guard we'll be at the disadvantage but will said no nah, man i'll let it go this time then we left when he hit the parking lot we got in Dwayne's side and the next thing you know on the passenger side blam 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 will was dead three to the head chance paused for some time and then broke the silence baby i didn't bring the ring you probably don't want to know how anyway because you're looking at a dead man with tears streaming down my face i said what do you mean you wouldn't understand baby it's the law of the streets they hit my man, now I gotta hit them. Don't try to argue a reason with me. You wouldn't understand. It's on. The war is on. But what about us? I can't do what I promised. I can't stop selling because I need the money to get things up. I still love you, but we're going to have to lay low for a while. This is how we're going to play it. I can't come to your place because I, I don't want to leave them to you. These motherfuckers would love to knock off my girl. I don't want you to come around my way because it's too dangerous. If they know I'm weak for you, they'll use it against me. Whatever you do, don't call my mother because the worrying would kill her. I'm going to have to throw 24-hour surveillance and protection on her anyway. Are you going to tell her what happened? I asked stupidly. Of course not. Knowing what put her in, knowing would put her in more danger because she would get nervous and start bugging out. If I throw the protection and surveillance on her, she'll go about her normal activity and she won't have to know nothing. Listen, don't call my job because I'm going to have to tell them something for the days I'm missing. I can't lose the job because that's my cover and my mother went through hell to hook it up for me. I'll call you as much as I can, but when I call, no crying. If you make me go soft, they'll get me. I'll lose my concentration and they'll take me out. You got it? For how long? I don't understand, I asked. You never understand these things. The war lasts till it's over. You think after I hit them back, they're going to stop? Hell no, they're going to come after me. So it'll go on till we get tired. But to let it all go would be suicide. Not only that, I can't let my will go out. I can't let my man will go out like that. I walked back to work in a daze. I could see Chance had made up his mind. It would be useless to fight him. He didn't want to hear it. I convinced myself that it was all out of my hands. The bottom line was that I had 30 days till the bus pulled out of New York for the African Youth Survival Camp in North Carolina. That was my priority. The facility was paid for. The equipment and supplies were purchased. The healthy menus were squared array. The black-owned bus company had been paid. Yes, sis. The curriculum was in order. All I had to do was to finish training the counselors. I had started nightly classes perhaps that would keep my mind off the madness in my personal life it be like that y'all y'all know i'm um well maybe you don't but years ago when i was still in college i used to do a lot of activism work and stuff in the community i'm still very much for my people buying black support and local networking connecting us i connect tons of people tons of stuff i don't post about that i do people meet in lincoln having whole businesses and projects together um that's my thing. But in my personal life, sometimes shit be jacked up. Like, especially with men. Like, it be getting really real. So, you don't really know what people is going through. And the fact that, like, this sister was, like, really still working for her people and trying to keep her mental stability um, together is quite commendable. But it's also very stressful. Um, and mental health is really real, too. A lot of the brothers that I've dealt with had mental health issues. I, I feel like one of them, I know for sure one had PTSD. I feel like another one probably had uh, multiple, excuse me, schizophrenia or multiple personality disorder or bipolarism, something. And it's like I draw them to me. I must have some type of healing energy about me. But it really um, will have you tripped out and have you, like, feeling like you're going crazy and you're trying to keep face and like still be who you are for the community and um to pay bills and then when you get home you just be in all types of emotional turmoil it's crazy i don't have an issue now thank god but it's real 
Um, the black owned bus company had been paid for. The curriculum was in order. All I had to do was finish training the counselors. I had started nightly classes. Perhaps they would keep my mind off the madness in my personal life. 48 hours later, Chance called at about 2 in the morning. I was in a deep sleep. Chance spoke briefly before hanging up, muttering something about still loving me and that he got one of them. I tried to get back to sleep, but... It was impossible. A few days later, Chance called again. He wanted to know if I could meet him with $3,000. I was shocked at the request and immediately asked him what happened to all of his money. He said he couldn't talk much on the phone, but he had put it in very good use. The proof was that he was still alive. I told him that I wasn't willing to contribute to anything that involved drugs. I added that the money would be my total savings plus some borrowed. That's when he said if it wasn't a matter of his mother, he wouldn't have asked. He had run out of protection money for his mother. He said paying guys to watch her around the clock was more expensive than he thought. He said that if she were killed because of him, he would never be able to forgive himself. He feared his enemies were so ruthless that they'd rather kill his mother and let him suffer for alive knowing that he was the cause of her death so i told chance i would do my best to get him the money i made arrangements to meet him away from my house or office when he picked up the cash i made arrangements to meet him away from my house or office when he picked up the cash he asked me not to cry he said this oh she a good one he said he would be forever grateful and he would repay me soon. On the verge of a nervous breakdown, filled with anxiety, I whispered, I loved you. I love you as he walked away. The next week, Chance called again. I asked how his son was and if he had seen him. He reminded me that I had promised I wouldn't ask emotional questions. It was bad for his head. Then he answered that he hadn't seen his son, which was heavy on his heart. But if he came out of this thing alive, why, me and him and his son would have our day together. He asked if I was giving up on him or if I still loved him. I told him I didn't love what he did but i did love him he promised that it would all be over soon he said i wouldn't have to worry about the drug thing anymore because when all was said and done he'd be out of business anyway wars destroy business he said and since he had me there would be no and since he had me there would be no sense in setting back up we could just get together and start our own business like i suggested the third week came and went, and I did not hear from Chance. The stress was tearing at me. I would try to go to sleep and would wake up tortured by scenes of shootouts, blood and death and destruction. I'd lay awake wondering what it would take to stop the cycle of death in our community. I think about how important the summer camp was for younger brothers who otherwise would grow up to face the same drab realities that men like Chance lived. I did not want this future for them. I realized my work with the children was my only source of relief. I love working with children, too, and special needs. It was now three days before I was due to depart for the camp. It had been a month since I had seen Chance and two weeks since I had last heard from him. Worry had given way to anger. Just then the phone rang. I picked it up. It was Blinky. Yeah, Chance told me to tell you. I don't care what Chance told you to tell me. I blurted out. Chance knows damn well that in two days I leave the state for the next six weeks. He knows how much I care for him and he couldn't even come see about me. I don't want to hear what you think. I don't want to hear from you, Blink. You ain't my man. Chance is. You tell him I said to hell with him. You tell him I said give me my damn $3,000 too. I slammed down the telephone. The day before departure, a Sunday, I sat in my office on Madison Avenue because that's where Blinky said Chance would meet me when he had called back. <laughs> I was so disgusted with Chance, his war, my love for him that I refused to wash. I was trying to convince myself that I didn't care for him anymore. I just wanted my money back. So I would greet him with dirty underarms and the same clothes from the night before. I would have no sex appeal for him. I would arrange to collect my money. I would change my telephone number so he could never call me again. Then the knock came to the side door. It was Chance with a proud yet anger face and Gary and Blinky standing there looking stupid. I looked at Chance. Chance looked back at me. We seemed emotionless and angry, both of us, so we didn't say anything to each other. Chance, Blinky, and Gary sat in the reception area, and since nobody was saying anything, I wasn't going to say anything either. That's when Blinky couldn't take it anymore. He got up and said, well, aren't you two going to say something? If you're not going to say nothing, what did I set up the meeting for? Finally, Chance got up and pointed toward my office. I got up and went in. He followed me, closed the door, and we stood motionless for a minute or so. I broke the ice. How could you do this to me? Do what? Do what to you? He said angrily. Have you ever seen a man killed? Do you know what it's like to have your friend's gut spilled all over your face? Do you know what it's like to lose half your best friends and, uh, and have the other half turn their backs on you because they're scared little bitches? Then the tears welled up in his eyes. Do you? Well, if you don't, then shut up. 
Nobody did anything to you. If anything, I kept you alive. I knew you wanted to see me. What do you think? I'm stupid or something? Do you think I don't know you want to see me? But what's deeper? What, what's a deeper love? Is it to satisfy myself by coming to see you only to see your gut spilled all over the sidewalk the next day for some bullshit that you don't even believe in? What's a deeper love? For me to involve you in something after all the work you've done in the community and have your name go down the drain because you're killed in a drug-related incident? You tell me what I should have done. Do you want to see me dead? Do you? Do you want me so choked up with love that I can't even shoot straight? So lost in love that my spot gets raided while I sit there fantasizing about you? My hardness melted away as the vi Men just be having a way with words when you be mad at them. My heart is melted away as the veil dropped from my heart. My eyes turned into seas of comfort. Chance continued. You knew I missed you. You knew I wanted to see you. What fool in his right mind would have a beautiful, thick, chocolate, voluptuous woman like you unattended? I know the sharks are waiting to take what's mine. I spoke softly. Nobody has touched me. I followed your directions. I did everything you asked me to. I didn't violate one word. Then what are you standing all the way over there for? Come and get what's yours. I walked toward him slowly. I was self-conscious because I was not clean. When I got up close to him, I made an excuse for myself. I was up all night, so I have not showered. He said, shh, give me what I've been waiting for. And in the small confines of my office, we made the best use of the space. We talked for another hour until interrupted by Blinky's impatient demand to go. Chance yelled through the closed door. Get away from the door, man. I'll be out when I'm done. He turned to me and said, So what's this about your money? That's always what it boils down to with all of you women. What about it? I stupidly responded. I was just angry. I needed to see you. I still get paid every two weeks, so I'm straight for right now. You can pay me later. Chance took the telephone number for the camp in North Carolina and promised to call. He said he was kind of glad I was going away because it would give him an opportunity to get his head together. He said he was feeling shell shot like somebody who had been sent away to fight and had been in the trenches too long. He said he would spend the, ne spend the time relaxing his nerves and forcing the images of blood and death out of his mind. He added that if I weren't going away, he and his present state of mind would be of no use to me anyway. Whatever Chance was, a drug dealer, a gangster, a murderer, my mind's eye simply refused to see him that way. When I looked at him, I only saw what he could be, not what he was. And day after day, those two images fought in my mind. I left with the children from North Carolina for our six-week educational journey. To my surprise, Chance was to call me every day of that trip during my one and only break at lunch. Aww. Whoever said that black people were strong because we had survived over 400 years of oppression was both right and wrong. Yes, we have survived in what were physically, in what, in, okay. Yes, they, they were right and wrong. Yes, we had survived in that we were physically still here. But the damage that we incurred psychologically was deep-seated and hard to overturn. The damage we received spiritually was even more debilitating. Each day that I worked alongside the counselors and Reverend Chavis with the children at the African Youth Survival Camp, I was shocked at the magnitude of damage that was done. There were layers upon layers of sickness that had to be peeled away before we got to ground zero. Yes, we have produced some prize scholars, scientists, singers, musicians, engineers, architects, and lawyers. But the vast majority of us were stuck. Yes, white supremacy had done its job as both the children, counselors, and older adults dealt with our scars in different ways and attempted to heal one another. But by the end of six weeks, there were many breakthroughs, some outright successes, and some failures. It was important that the camp had happened. I could not have learned better lessons at any college or by reading any book. When I return to New York, life experience will always teach you the best. When I returned to New York, I was so exhausted, I checked into a hotel for four days and gave no one the telephone number besides my boss, Reverend Travis. At the end of the four days, I met Chance for lunch. We talked and laughed and hugged. He confided that he wanted to slow everything down the way it was in the beginning. I didn't mind. After all, I wasn't prepared to rush into a marriage, but my love for him was very much alive. I thought about how... Far from breaking us up completely, our crisis seemed to increase our passion and connection. Things went fine for the next three weeks. Time seemed just like old times. Then my world turned upside down. I was home in my apartment. The telephone rang. There was what seemed... Why she renting hotels if she was back? Okay. Then my world turned upside down. I was home in my apartment. The telephone rang. There was what seemed to be a small voice on the other end that was either whispering or just difficult to hear. The voice said, Hello. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for calling... But is Mike there? I think you have the wrong number, I said. No, wait a minute. Chance. Is Chance there? No, he's not here right now. Can I help you? 
I'm sorry, this is Lola. It's an emergency or I wouldn't have called. The baby is sick and I need to speak to Chance. Lola, I'm his wife. I gasped for air, but there wasn't any left in the room. There was only heat on the walls, closed in on my existence. My head felt light and I fell on the couch. Only the girl's voice revived me as it faded in and out, as it faded in and out, in and out. Where did you get this number? I asked slowly. From a sheet of paper I found in his pocket a long time ago. He would kill me if he knew I was calling because he always tells me not to interfere in his business dealings, but it's an emergency. Well, Lola, you don't have to be sorry because I'm sorry. For the past year and some time, I've been Chance's girlfriend. We were supposed to get married two months ago, but I've been away. What? She screamed as her little voice turned into an indignant cry. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Here he come now. I hear the key in the door. Mike, come in here. Then I heard what was definitely Chance's smooth voice. The tears filled up in my eyes, warm, hot tears. I heard him say, what's wrong, baby? What you all worked up about? Just as if he were talking to me. Then, in a dramatic switch, the little small voice that seemed timid and harmless shouted, This bitch claims you've been fucking her for the past year. Who? He grabbed the phone from her. Hello? He said innocently, sniffing and bewildered. I said, What's up, Chance? It's me. How could you do this to me? How could you be so low and evil? Then I heard some wrestling. The phone dropped down on the floor and bounced. You never said you was going to fuck her. That's not what we agreed on when we heard her on the radio. You said you was going to get the record deal and the goddamn money. You didn't say shit about sex. Now, who the fuck does she think she talk? What? Wait a minute. So the wife was in on it? Let me go back. You never said you was going to fuck her. That's not what we agreed on when we heard her on the radio. You said you was going to get the record deal and the goddamn money. You didn't say shit about sex. Now, who the fuck does she think she is talking about? You her goddamn man. You better get on the phone and tell her. Tell her. Tell her we're married. We've been married. We got one son and one on the way. We live in Queens and we're happy. Tell her so she can get off your dick. Then I heard someone pick the phone back up, and it was her again. He doesn't love you. He was just fucking you for the money. It was just business. Tell her. Go ahead, tell her. Then I heard a hand wrap around the receiver, trying to conceal their conversation. I strained, and I could still hear. It was Chance saying, will you stop? You're messing up everything. You mad now, but if you tell her what's up, you're going to be madder later when the money run out. Come on, I got her right where we need her. Then I heard them wrestle again, and she said, fuck that. I don't care. Fuck it was never part of the deal. Married. She's bugging all the way out. Now you tell her. Chance got on the phone. And the role reversal of the century. This confident masculine bastion gave, who gave all the directions and called all the shots sounded like a trained puppy dog. He said faintly, hello. I eat out of what was now my small voice. Yes. And with no hesitation, all he said, at, and with no hesitation at all, he said, I don't love you and I never did. Click. Woo. Honey, that would have me toe up from the flow up. That was chapter six of No Disrespect, Chance. It's so hard to see deception coming. People put on a whole front. I read or heard something one time that was talking about, like, abusers, like, people that physically abuse and do domestic violence on women. That like, they don't, they were, they were, like, in a group counseling session or something. And they all, like, majority of them agreed that, like, they didn't start showing the signs of that until, like, a year or so after they were with the person. So, it's, like, people that have character flaws like that they will like play mind games and manipulate you until they're ready to show their true self and by then you already caught up and wrapped up it's terrible it's sad but i really appreciate her for expressing these truths of these different things she went through in her life with these men the college love ended up being on the down low the other guy was married and she was lusting for him this chance guy seemed like he had it all together and then turned out he was a butthole too so crazy crazy but i appreciate y'all for tuning in it helped release my stress i told y'all i was emotional today so reading helps calm me down so i appreciate y'all for tuning in and be on the lookout for more live videos for me peace love and like